The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests of Frontline are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined today by Dr. James Neunschwander. He is a physician, a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physician, research director and attending physician, Genesis Healthcare System Emergency Department, and also an adjunct associate professor at the Ohio State University. And of course, he did put that in uh, the in capital, like all Ohio <laughs> State people always do. Um, and I'm glad we're able to talk today because it's the day after uh, Ohio State uh, can refocus on actual healthcare and medicine. Um, yes. Because uh, we are uh, day plus one of their uh, shellacking at the hands of oh. the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide, which, oh. you know, and I was actually, I thought that, um, I thought they were going to, I mean, I actually thought Ohio State was going to cover and, and stay under that plus nine no. that they had. But no. wow, that second quarter was just like, oh. That was we, that was watching practice right there, um, yeah. so that was that was a pretty rough moment. But we're not going to talk about football because I, <laughs> I, I don't want. To, Boy, am I glad too, <laughs> Jim, to want to to have concerns about his health and safety. Uh, but we're gonna, what we're going to talk about is something else that involves a lot of health and safety uh, with regard to hyperkalemia. And we've actually talked to uh, Dr. Nguyen-Chwander in the past about hyperkalemia, and we're going to refocus on the status of hyperkalemia, the available treatments, as well as um, what we're seeing with regard to COVID uh, and hyperkalemia as a secondary byproduct of the damage mm-hmm. to kidneys. So, uh, Jim, thanks for joining us again. And, you know, interestingly... You know, talking to you after such a challenging uh, time, uh, the thoughts and prayers um, right now. And I'm sitting here where we actually were last together yes, right. we're dinner. Um, a little less than a year ago, about mm-hmm. 49, 48, 49 weeks ago here in uh, Park City, Utah for that conference. My wife is doing one of the Third Rock, um, Third Rock Ultrasound conferences. And so we're here with the uh, family to do some social distancing on the side of a hill with just Absolutely. us. And, so we're here, and I'm glad to have you back. Absolutely. It's great to be here, and uh, much appreciation to ASEP for uh, sponsoring the expert consensus panel on uh, hyperkalemia. Um, this has been a great opportunity to get together. We have a nephrologist on the expert consensus panel. Uh, Matt Weir is out of the University of Maryland. We have three emergency phys- or four emergency physicians, uh, Dr. Frank Peacock from Baylor, Zubaid uh, Rafiq also from Baylor, Jason Bischoff from Ohio State. Uh, we have a pharmacist, Joanna Hudson, and a nurse, and myself uh, from the Genesis Healthcare System. So it's been really nice. We we put some things together, uh, looking at how to treat hyperkalemia and what to do with this disease state, which has uh, certainly had a peak or a rise since COVID has come into play. So, um, as you mentioned, the consensus panel, uh, which apparently to be an emergency physician, the consensus panel, you have to be somebody who's been involved with a college football program with significant issues <laughs> in the recent past. Um, so now we know what you need to do to qualify for that program. Um, so if you are a long suffering football fan of college football, you may be up for a leadership position, um, with the consensus yes. panel on hyperkalemia. So, uh, you know, keep that, keep that as your ace in your pocket. <laughs> Um, so where are we right now with uh, hyperkalemia? Give us, give, give us just a, a basic, simple idea of the challenges that we face, hyperkalemia, and what we're going to look for in the emergency department. Well, I think th- we were talking yesterday. I, I was uh, meeting with Dr. Peacock, and we were uh, working with a group out of Minneapolis on uh, the chronic disease research group. And we said that hyperkalemia is really kind of a data-free zone. There's not a lot of research that's been done on it in terms of management treatment. Uh, Dr. Peacock and some of uh, our colleagues did a study and uh, found that hyperkalemia treatment had about 144 different management styles in terms of using calcium, insulin, plus dextrose, plus bicarb, plus albuterol. So there really hasn't been a standard And what ASAP had hoped that we would do is get together and just really look at the data and drill down on what should we use? Should it be calcium gluconate, calcium chloride? Should we be using insulin? Should we be using bicarb on everyone or not? 
And um, after hours and hours of debate, and we're still not completely through it, it's been interesting. We think we have a pretty decent set of strategies for different layers of uh, or levels of hyperkalemia and have really drilled down on the data to get an idea of what is best for our patients. When do we push for dialysis? When can we do something different than what we used to do? And how does that fit in our day-to-day -day management? As a community emergency physician, you know, I'm, I'm accustomed to the, oh, hyperkalemia, first and foremost <laughs> thought is recheck the lab. Yes. That's ensure, ensure it's a, it's a, a, if it's not expected in terms mm -hmm. of a level, recheck your lab value, make sure that it's accurate with the sensitivity to hemolysis. Um, getting your EKG, look for any type of EKG changes, um, you know, initially with the peaking T waves and eventually with the badness that mm -hmm. um, is the changes we look for right before um, CPR. Sure. Um, and then, you know, and then our basic treatments with insulin, albuterol, uh, mm -hmm. calcium, all those types of things that we're going to do um, up front, kind of throwing that kitchen sink at stabilizing the cell membranes and then eventually starting mm -hmm. to hopefully shift a little bit and then hopefully flush it. Um, right. Less and less of that flushing aspect is done within the emergency department now. But with this panel that you're involved with, what are some of the big take-home messages from the presentation of hyperkalemia and what we look for and do in the emergency department? Absolutely. And I think that one of the issues that many of us face with hyperkalemia is we kind of just wish that uh, it's not real. And I know for myself, sometimes I'll, I would in the past get back a 5.9 or even a 6.0 and hope I could just get the patient admitted before uh, the second level came back so I wouldn't have to do anything and just say I thought it was hemolysis. So one of the other things that we looked at is, you know, is it real hyperkalemia and is it something that I should do with it now or should I just let them take care of it on the floor in the ICU or in dialysis? So we really did take a look at, you know, pseudo hyperkalemia versus spurious hyperkalemia. Spurious meaning that you had a lab error, you know, the handling, something was shaken up uh, versus a pseudo hyperkalemia, which is where it looks elevated say in the instance of elevated red blood cells, white blood cells, you can see it with leukemia. And no matter how many times you check it, you're going to see an elevated potassium due to cell lysis because of the white blood cells being so fragile, the red blood cells being so fragile, is to really look at those situations and say, um, is this true hyperkalemia? And we have a pretty nice little paper and we're hoping we have an MPOC uh, app that's coming out soon with a flow chart. And then we're going to uh, hopefully submit a paper to a reputable journal and uh, see if we can get that pleasure. We, we go into detail about recognizing spurious versus uh, pseudo hyperkalemia. And then once we recognize what we have is to really risk stratify and what's the level at which we start treating. We recommend 5.5 because once you start to give above 5.5 or higher, we said that we don't know the rate at which it'll continue to go up. We know that hyperkalemia has is an independent risk factor for death. Uh, if it's, it's kind of a U-shaped curve, if it's too low, the lower it is, the higher chance you have of dying. And as the higher it gets, even with all of the things considered, uh, it's likely to cause a uh, greater mortality. So it is something that we need to jump on. And we recommended 5.5 as our beginning. And uh, the therapies that we recommended, we're still kind of arguing back and forth on some of them right now. EKGs are not very sensitive, but if you do have EKG changes, definitely use calcium. And uh, one of the final points that we're debating right now is do you use uh, calcium on somebody that doesn't have EKG changes? And uh, we will definitely have that hammered out for you. You got to check the MPOC uh, um, in, the, in the paper to see what we finally decide. So uh, we go back and forth on that one. And we actually talked about the EMPOC or Emergency Medicine Point of Care app back in mm -hmm. 2018, no, 2019, mm -hmm. uh, when it was released. Um, and so that will go on there as part of a, a benefit to um, ASAP members um, and available for everybody, but for the ASAP members, uh, a, a free thing that uh, going to be added to in terms of tools and things that you can use uh, within your um, emergency department and daily practice. There's actually a fair amount of uh, things already in there, especially regarding geriatrics and uh, opioid base, but also some other um, other key tools as well. AFib. So this will be added. Yeah, AFib. So that'll be uh, all that will be added uh, to that. Where are we? I know that on our last discussion, we talked about some of the um, shift 
away from uh, the traditional treatment for, I mean, in terms of clearing of potassium with K-exalate. Um, kind of review where we are with K-exalate, why it's, uh, again, why it's on the outs in case somebody isn't quite sure why it's on the outs. And mm-hmm. then where are we moving with the current uh, plan for uh, clearance in lieu of that treatment? Well, k was a drug that was grandfathered in by the FDA. If you take a look at when uh, it was approved in 1958, there really weren't any great safety or efficacy standards that were in place. So it was a drug that was basically studied in about five patients. Three of them died, but all of them had their potassium go down. So they said, okay, let's go ahead and use this. The FDA started seeing problems with it causing bowel necrosis, bowel perforation, and even death, and then gave it a black box warning. So the uh, efficacy has always been questioned. I, I've talked in certain places and said that the uh, medical students were not allowed to eat until they found me a definitive efficacy study on um, SPS or KXLate. And uh, that's, I think, my old Hopkins stuff torturing people because they never can find one despite their cell phones and using their computers because there really isn't any real data that says it's efficacious in the acute care setting or in any really setting. Yet uh, we continue to use it knowing that there is a black box warning. And so I think the movement is away from k with all the dangers and inherent risks that go with it. So uh, with that being said, there is a new group of binders that are out there. They're not terribly expensive. I know in our facility that uh, the binder that we use primarily is about $3.81 which is uh, music to emergency physicians' ears when we know that these days there's so many new drugs that are coming out that are extraordinarily expensive. In some cases, the drug is uh, going to be a little bit more because we're a disproportionate share hospital, also a community hospital, much like yours, Ryan. Uh, But it can be up to about 16, 17, maybe 18 bucks. Nonetheless, uh, these binders aren't uh, very expensive. And they seem to have some good data. And since the last time you and I talked, the Energize trial had, uh, has been uh, published and showed some at least favorable results utilizing a binder in the emergency department with hyperkalemia. It was a small study, only 70 patients. Yet of the patients that received a binder, they certainly did have improvement in lowering their potassium compared to placebo. There were no increased adverse effects. And so Uh, The nice thing is that there's no diarrhea with these binders. And uh, as you and I were talking about beforehand with COVID being where it's at, to not have to waste all the PPE that goes along with utilizing k that certainly the new binders make a lot of sense in the acute care setting. And if you look at some of the data that came out of New York City during the uh, COVID crisis was that they were using lots and lots of binder, uh, in particular the sodium zirconium cyclosislocate. And we're seeing potassium levels come down because of the uh, kidney injury, uh, and they weren't having to use a lot of PPE by using KXLate. So it seemed to have some favorable impact in that regard. So basically, this technology kind of run through this binder. You mentioned the binders, and Mm -hmm. um, you know some may not understand how these medications function. I mean, it's kind of in the binders, but Mm -hmm. you know the the whole idea of KXLate was it was a binder and caused diarrhea. Uh, with these new ones of binding, kind of discuss that function uh, that we're talking about and, and how it actually proceeds to achieve that overall decrease in potassium levels. So what they what we do with the binders is, and we've been using it, the binders for close to uh, two years now, and they uh, take it, it's usually <clears throat> in a powder form, mixed up, and then dr- drink, the patient takes it as a drink, And uh, I think it's important to recognize that for these binders to work, somebody has to have a functioning GI system. So if they're vomiting, clearly uh, it would not be a great choice unless you can stop the vomiting. If they have a bowel obstruction, if they're severely impacted and constipated, it's not going to get down to the portion of the bowel where it needs to work. So largely what happens is somebody ingests this binder, it gets into the gut, and it starts to bind potassium and then is not systemically absorbed goes down to the large intestine. In the case, again, of the uh, sodium zirconium cyclosislocate, the localma starts to work in the small intestine. The other one, pteromeres, doesn't start to work to the large intestine. Um, Localma also works in the large intestine, but we start to see results of that binding uh, often within an hour or two. And 
I've had cases where I had a, a patient who had a potassium in the high sixes that needed her pacemaker swapped out. And um, they, no way were they going to take her to an EP lab, Ryan, with uh, a potassium of, you know, 6.9 and uh, have her pooping all over the place with KXL8. She was in her 90s, so we couldn't get her dialyzed. Uh, or that wasn't going to be easy to do. So we actually just gave her uh, a binder, watched her potassium come down, checked her two hours later. Uh, it was under six, and they took her to the EP lab, swapped her battery out, and uh, she went home a couple days later and did much better. That would have been a disaster in terms of disposition uh, had we not had a binder to get that potassium down and, and move her through the uh, system and get her the care that she needed, uh, which you know obviously was life-saving. So we're seeing you. You said you had a transition a couple of years ago uh, to these binders in your in mm -hmm. your facility, um, and a lot of places, a lot of our physicians, uh, PAs and PS out there, are going to be facing the fact that the the standard in their facility, the um, you know what is stocked, is still going to be the the KX late. How can mm -hmm. we make that process that change in facilities that have been uh, so far uh, resistant to transition or not aware of of the tra uh, transition that's happening? I think one of the, the nicest thing with our pharmacy is when they looked at the binders being less expensive than k actually, in our shop. k hard to store. You have to mix it, and it has to be refrigerated afterwards. And, I, and again, this is from pharmacy. I've never had to manage it, anything like that, but that's my understanding. Uh, these are individually packaged. Uh, they don't need to be refrigerated. So from a pharmacy standpoint, we, we spoke to them, and they said, uh, absolutely. This makes sense. Let's bring it on. It's cheaper than the old stuff. It seems to have work better. Nephrology loves it. Uh, and they like it because we've actually, and we've, we're getting ready to, uh, you know, analyze our data. But what we have seen is that a decrease in hemodialysis for emergent hyperkalemia by 33%. So Ryan, if you can imagine it's 10 o'clock at your shop, it's probably much like mine getting the dialysis team at 10 o'clock at night in to do dialysis is a nightmare, right? So what we've been able to do is in certain cases, uh, I had a guy that came over from interventional radiology not too long ago. He had, uh, they were trying to fix his fistula, yet his blood pressure came down when they consciously sedated him. His potassium had been high when he went over there. They didn't get uh, it fixed and they sent him to me instead of trying to get somebody else to fix uh, the, the access problem or doing anything different, we just gave him some more uh, Localma, lowered, check, rechecked his potassium, and then put him in the hospital. So it literally changed our management. So nephrology is on board with it because they're not coming in to have to do as much emergent dialysis. Uh, pharmacy liked it because it was cheaper. Internal medicine likes it because uh, we're not sending them patients that are pooping all over the place. Our nurses like it. And uh, so it's really, it's, it's been a win-win for all the, the folks involved and still knowing that, you know, it's, it's, somebody's got to have a working gut. Um, you got to be careful not to give a medicine within two hours, uh, an oral medicine within two hours of the time that it's given. So either two hours before, or two hours after. And um, yeah, it seems to be working. Now there's still going to be people and this is what we've talked about in the in the expert consensus panel. There's still going to be people that are going to have to go to dialysis. I mean, that's that's the key. Um, yet this is a very nice temporizing measure that we give, even if they're on their way to dialysis. Nephrology has said, yeah, go ahead and get the potassium down as quickly as you can. We'll go ahead and dialyze them later whenever we can. Are all of these uh, new preparations? Is everything an oral? Uh, so if somebody can't, so somebody who's had a stroke or somebody who's vomiting or, you know, whatever it may be, um, are all of, are all of these an oral preparation? Is there none that may uh, go the wrong way down the one-way street? Yeah. So if somebody, you can use an NG tube, they can go down the NG tube. It has not been uh, studied as a uh, suppository or giving it rectally, which is still an advantage for uh, KX to some degree is that there is actually an indication for it to be given rectally. So I'm hoping that they're going to study these binders. I mean, they work in the large intestine. It wouldn't make any um, sense that, that you couldn't just go ahead and give it, but I don't think it's, you know, it's not an indication. So that'd be an off-label utilization of it. And what everybody else is missing out on here, since this is an audio podcast, is the video aspects of, uh, of Jim actually 
uh, not only uh, in the basement dwelling of his morning place with his Ohio State football sweatshirt on, but acting out all of these things that he is talking about. Um, it's basically a liturgical dance of a podcast that I'm getting to observe and watch and enjoy, uh, and probably just capped off by uh, how Dr. Neuenschwander administers a, a rectal or suppository-based medication, um, which appears to be with a fair amount of force, so remind me not to get sick with anything lower GI. Oh, brother, you do not, man. In, in the central portion of Ohio. <laughs> In fact, in, in fact, next time my board review comes back around, I may have to look at a different course because I don't necessarily want to necessarily be there where accidents could happen. Uh, and could but you don't, up. man. Because if, <laughs> if you really make me mad on this podcast, you'll be getting a garden hose for a Foley instead of something that's uh, absolutely uh, appropriate. So I know that will get edited out, or at least I hope that it does. No, no, I don't edit. <laughs> this is a conversation. Uh, we don't edit. Absolutely. Uh, We're real ER docs, man. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> that really won't happen, but everybody is uh, is missing out on on the acting out aspects of the podcast today. It um, is fun. Where are we uh, with with the panel that you're mm -hmm. uh, involved with? Um, sure. Where is that line for, and I think we all in emergency medicine yeah. um, struggle with, where is that line for, you know, just going after um treatments that we traditionally do versus referral for dialysis, unless somebody is clearly already a dialysis patient, we can still potentially bridge with those medications until they get dialysis. But where is that line where we say, you know what, this is going to be a dialysis case as opposed to just hitting them with a kitchen sink um, running list of, of medicines that we give? So our lines, we have a couple different lines. So 5.5 .5 is the treatment line. If you get somebody at 5.5, .5, it's probably smart to at least start treating it. Um, what you decide to use as your treatment therapies will vary on your level of concern. Again, if you think somebody's going uh, high at a rapid rate, then <clears throat> hit them hard. Uh, six, definitely treatment. 6.5 is where we started to draw that line of saying, okay, the difference between urgent versus uh, emergent dialysis, which is if you're 6.5, or above, I'm calling the I'm calling the nephrologist, and I'm going to say, "Hey, listen, man, I think you're going to need to spin this guy or this gal. This is going to need to happen." So, 6.5 was kind of our cutoff. We're saying we got to get the team called, mobilized, and going. We'll provide treatment between now and then, and recheck. But largely, if you're above that line, then uh, you're you're we're consulting nephrology and getting them um, mobilized. Again, this is just, there, there's not a ton of data. This is a data-free zone, largely hyperkalemia. And, you know, these are things that have been passed down from one giant to another giant from all these folks. And we are embarrassed that there's not more data that's available. But those were the cutoffs that we utilize 5.5 .5 to treat and 6.5 to start uh, the process of dialysis. And one thing we've that we've chatted about that has now added a new wrinkle um, to hyperkalemia uh, has been the thing that has hijacked the entire all of 2020 and is going to do much of 2021 as well, and that is COVID. Yeah. And you know we've as we educate on on COVID, it's all about the fact that it is the virus of many faces, yes. and the way it damages the body uh, about how it which ACE2 uh, receptors it decides to bind to and thus produce mm -hmm. symptoms and damage. And um, we've seen a significant impact on the, um, on the renal system and thus yes. brings it into this same topic that we're talking about with hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. Talk about Absolutely. the uh, role of, of COVID uh, with regard to hyperkalemia and what we're seeing uh, within emergency medicine and across the country. Well, you're right. It, it attacks so many different parts of the body, which makes it such a hard disease to treat. And depending on the data that you're looking at, it, you know, it's 10% or more are having some issues with their kidneys. So we're definitely seeing it. And we're seeing patients at a higher rate uh, of needing kidney replacement therapy or dialysis, issues like that. And um, it just makes everything else that much more tricky. I mean, they're having the respiratory issues. They're having GI issues. They're having all these different things. I don't know the mechanism, and I'm not sure that anybody does, uh, why it attacks the kidney and what the uh, exact mechanism, uh, mechanism of it is. But certainly, uh, my colleagues are seeing more renal failure, 
uh, than they ever have before. The services, the nephrology service is just absolutely slammed right now. And um, we're seeing it. And again, the, you know, the advantage to the binder is uh, the newer binders is that they don't cause that diarrhea that k does. And you can actually treat them instead of, you know, wheeling them up and down to the dialysis unit and exposing everyone else and uh, having to the, the change all that PPE out. It certainly makes sense to use a binder in this setting and the utilization of it has been higher in places where they're having uh, higher incidence of COVID and kidney uh, injuries. So give us some of the uh, final take home messages from the consensus panel uh, and recommendations for our docs uh, and any final thoughts that you may have that we haven't discussed thus far. Absolutely, thanks. Is the treat early, treat often, recheck. So if you think somebody really is 5.7 or 6.2, treat it. You know, hit them with the calcium uh, if you're concerned about an arrhythmia and uh, have EKG changes. If they're acidotic, go ahead and give them bicarb insulin along with dextrose because there's a huge issue, or not a huge, but there's a significant issue of people getting hypoglycemic with this management. Recheck them. See where you're at in the process. Find out in two to four hours if you're concerned that it's still going up or that something else needs to occur and you need more definitive treatment. Get nephrology on the phone early if you're concerned. We said 6.5 for dialysis, but I think 6 to 6.5, if I have a feeling that somebody's going bad and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to call nephrology then because I don't want to call them, recheck at 4.45 and find out that the tech has just left. So get help, get help early. And consider the new binders. You know, how is it that you need to have them introduced at your hospital? I know in some places, nephrology wants to control them. But why would nephrology control, a, you know, a $15 drug and want us to ask Mother May I? I remember when we asked, they at one point were asked, telling us we couldn't use propofol in the emergency department to do conscious sedations. So um, we said, sure, we'll call anesthesia every time we used it. And we made sure that we called them for every single conscious sedation we did, particularly those after seven, eight, nine, or 10 o'clock at night, and 11 o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And guess what happened, Ryan? They dropped that requirement that we had to call anesthesia. Isn't that interesting? So, uh, you know, work with nephrology, let them know, hey, there's a benefit to you guys. Your staff aren't going to need to come in for uh, emergent dialysis as often, possibly. They won't need to go to such a high level of care, such as an ICU, because their potassium is higher. We're actually sending patients to OBS and dosing them. We're sending patients home and then having them go out and get their dialysis. So if you don't have it, uh, certainly it would be interesting to get it on formulary. If you do have it, check it out. Uh, it's not an expensive drug, and we didn't see a lot of adverse events. And the emergency medicine literature is growing because we're doing more studies, and we'll just have to see uh, how it works out in that setting. All right, talking uh, with uh, Dr. James Neuenschwander, um, the morning after, <laughs> during morning of his loss of his Ohio State Buckeyes. Apparently, they are really good for six games, but that seventh just <laughs> seventh really... Seventh game is a killer. That seventh game is just can't do it. Um, so, oh, um, man. That's okay. I mean, they, they actually <laughs> put on okay. a great show. They really shellacked it to... Uh, uh, they really shellacked <laughs> it to Clemson. And, yeah, um, and made so, them pay. Yeah, it's so... Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't want to too good. I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know that you probably have a lot of <laughs> a lot of walking around with with dark veils Tissues. And, and tears yeah. and, and candles today. So, <laughs> I will, let me tell the one nice thing. The 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 great story is so you you see the basement that we're in. My beautiful wife and I were watching the game. You met Colleen. Um, Upstairs, my daughter, who graduated from OSU this spring, was watching with her friends. And so even though we took a shellacking, Alabama's the national champs, best team in the country, doubtlessly. I mean, I, I think they are. And the SEC, once again, has uh, proven to be superior. I'm going to give you that. But I will say that the part that warmed my heart the most was hearing the kids after the game upstairs singing the Ohio State uh, fight song, Carmen, Ohio, and unifying and remembering how cool it is that sports do bring us together emergency medicine, all the cool things that we do when we work together, we can do even greater things to help our patients, our community, and our lives. So I, I do think that as we unify things, life does get better. 
And the good news is you've got a good eight months before you have to be distracted <laughs> by to... football once again, at least. Um, and then take another beating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe the conference will once again decide to cancel the entire season and then say they're not going to revisit it and then revisit it two weeks later and then decide to restart it and then oh my maybe goodness. change the rules to the end. And then, I know. you know, hashtag COVID. That's just the way Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. How can, how can folks get in touch with you if they've got uh, more questions and want more information on hyperkalemia or the sad state of Ohio State football today? They can call or they can email me at jim.neuen at gmail.com, jim.newen at gmail.com, or the new MD, uh, and that's T H E N E U M D um, at Twitter. So, and remember the, uh, the we'll have the uh, the uh, addition to the EM point of care app upcoming data will be released shortly. And I sit here and, and talk all high and mighty like I've, I'm talking down <laughs> on Ohio State football. I live in Lexington, Kentucky, with UK football uh, representing my you guys locality. Have a football team? Uh, they, the, the rumor and, um, and basketball, which, uh, once again, uh, we're challenged with the 17 better. or 18 year old cohesion, but they're coming together. Um, and I went to college and med school to place that's got one double A football and basketball where I can be my own little ETSU cheering section. Um, and, and the one chance they had to really maybe make a, a, a one or two game, uh, advancement within the NCAA uh, March Madness and what do you know it gets canceled because of COVID and the coach is hired out and goes goes elsewhere so um, you know I'm not one to say much but since you are in the basement in a state of mourning with your Ohio State football <laughs> shirt on I couldn't pass up the opportunity even though I did go to sleep last night before the game was over so uh, as, as for me you can contact me at uh, rstanton at G, uh, excuse me rstanton at asap.org rstanton at asap.org uh, also, our traditional your everyday medicine gmail.com. We have our Facebook page and at Everyday Med on Twitter as well. We encourage everybody to follow along, subscribe, share. Uh, we like to have these conversations, these practice uh, altering and changing discussions, as well mm -hmm. as some uh, discussions just about life as emergency medicine. So mm -hmm. um, join in the conversation and the adventure with us. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Mm -hmm.